Good evening, good evening, and welcome to this fantastic show. I'm excited to have this show. I'm, I'm because I, I cannot hide my excitement about this show. And we have been talking about this for how long, Dr. Brooke? We've been talking about doing this. A long time. Yeah. A long time. So here we are. Yeah. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the first show uh, called Melanin Poppin' Real Derms, Real Talk with at Dr. Brooke. Derm. Uh, I, of course, am Ellis Dean, the Director of Digital Program and Production at BlackDoctor.org. And as you can see, we have the fantastic uh, Dr. Brooke Jackson, also known on social media as at Dr. Brooke Derm, here with us. And so we're going to be talking about all things dermatology. So we're going to be talking about get that skin under control, right? And not for me, but for those of you that still have hair, we're going to be helping you keep your hair and talk about all those different fashions. Cause I've learned there's a number of different types of alopecia and we all try to put it, put it in one bucket. And Dr. Brooks is going to give you those secret tips to say, you know what? You need to get a diagnosis before you just start trying all these different products out there. So I've learned that much enough to be dangerous. But before we get into all of that, and tonight we've got a great show on hyperpigmentation. So I want you to stick around about that. And we're going to talk about how, what it is, how to deal with it, all the stuff about hyperpigmentation. So I want you to stick around for that. But before you do, number one, you know how we do it here. First thing I need for you to do is let us know where you're watching from. That means you got to drop your city in the comments. We need to let us know. Give your city a shout out, city and state or country if you're watching us from another country. Number two, if you know somebody that would want this information or need this information, share this on your page tag a friend, let them know, hey, we're here. We've got a dermatologist that's going to give you all that you need right here on blackdoctor.org. And number three, if you have any questions, and I'm sure you do because we're going to be talking to a dermatologist, you have any questions about tonight's topic or anything dermatology related, drop those in the questions in the comments as well. If we can't get to it tonight, what we'll do is we might make a whole show out of it, right? If it's something that we feel like everybody can, can use, we might just make a whole show out of your questions. So get your questions in tonight because we want to make sure that we're answering all your dermatology questions. And I'm so excited about this because every time we did a show, and Dr. Brooke knows it because she's been our go-to dermatologist. Every time we would do a show on dermatology, it would just explode. We'd have such a great time. I think we did something uh, on alopecia after the slap at the Grammys. And we've done all, a ton of shows. And every time they do so well, we did something earlier this year, January, for our a state of Black Health, and that was a fantastic program. And so we said, let's finally get this going. So I'm so excited we got this. So as you can see, I'm brimming with excitement to get this done. Thank you for getting your comments coming on, but I'm going to shut up and welcome Dr. Brooke. How are you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. It is a lot of fun. I love chatting with you and I love answering the questions. And so <laughs> let's get to it. <laughs> They're already coming in. We already got questions coming in. So this is fantastic. All right. So we're tonight we're talking about tonight's topic is the, the main topic is hyperpigmentation. But please, if you have any questions about anything else, please put those in because we will go back, look at your questions. If we can't give you an answer in a short blurb, like I said, we might flip it and turn it into a whole show. So hyperpigmentation. Now I know what hyper is, but because I've been described like that my whole life, but I don't think that's what we're talking about when we say hyperpigmentation. So give our audience kind of a, a general understanding of what is hyperpigmentation. So um, it's actually the number one concern of patients with skin of color. And so, you know, interestingly, I have a pretty diverse practice. I'm in Durham, North Carolina. And when I listen to patients as they come in, it is always fascinating to me about what it is that they are primarily concerned about. And my folks who've got brown skin, they want to be one color brown. And so what happens often is we are many colors of brown in, in one person. <laughs> so sometimes when we get a little bit darker and some that dark may be due to trauma, like you may have fallen down and scraped your knee and your scar has turned dark. It may be that you're on some sort of sun sensitizing medication like high blood pressure medicine or diabetes medicine. You go out in the sun and forget to wear sunscreen. And, or it may be that you have an inflammatory condition like acne or eczema. And once the acne or eczema goes away, you are left with discoloration. And so hyperpigmentation means excess. 
The cells that make us brown are called melanocytes. And when they are injured, they make a little bit extra melanin. So I explain to patients, it's almost like your melanocytes, your pigment producing cells are saying, ouch, when they get injured. And when they get mm -hmm. injured, they make too much melanin and that turns into hyperpigmentation. Wow, okay. So it sounds like anybody can get it, can get hyperpigmentation, no matter what ethnicity, or is it just, but it's more noticeable when you have uh, darker skin? Correct. Okay. Yeah. So how, the, the $50 million question is, you know we can get it, we know who gets it and, and what's what makes it, you know, yourself say, ouch. Is there something that we can do to treat it? And I want to say get rid of it because it's not something that's, you know, but if somebody wants to get rid of it, is how would they do that? Yeah, so, you know, whenever a patient um, puts on their reason for visit, hyperpigmentation, the conversation that I always start with is trying to figure out what caused it, right? So if it is active acne and the acne is not under control, we have to get that under control first. Because while we can do things to help with hyperpigmentation, none of it is going to work or work well unless we take care of the reason that caused it. And so whether it is acne or eczema, you know, certainly during the last few years, we've had people who've got a lot of stress and anxiety, they're picking, Sometimes at their acne lesions, they may be picking at their eczema lesions. That is causing hyperpigmentation. Sometimes they've just gone out to a picnic and the bugs like them and they're quite tasty. And right. so those are the ones that may get a little bit of hyperpigmentation from a bug bite. You may walk into the bed corner um, as you're going to the bathroom at night and get a little bruise and that might turn into hyperpigmentation. And so we, it's always important to address the reason that caused it first um before we can figure out how to make it better well we've got a great question here already coming in from from our audience it says uh this is from yvonne she is asking how to get rid of a keloid uh of keloids which turn into hyperpigmentation yeah so um keloids are scars and um, the way that I usually explain it to patients is if you heal, sometimes your body does a little too much. So a normal mm -hmm. scar really should be flat and kind of in the same area, same location as the original injury. Let's say you had surgery and they closed you up and you have a linear scar, straight scar at the site of the inc incision. That's normal. If your scar overgrows the site of the original injury, for example, I have a lot of patients who've had C-sections and they have the linear scar, the lower abdomen, but sometimes it's a little bit thicker. A thicker scar in the same area is called a hypertrophic scar. A keloid is over the boundary, right? So it gets larger than the site of injury. Okay. Very common area for keloids may be the earlobe. Mm -hmm. You might have gotten ears pierced or had your ear ripped and the scar overgrows the site of injury. It's important really to explain the difference between a keloid and a hypertrophic scar because they behave differently. Okay. So I always tell patients that a keloid has a mind of its own. It is gonna go through a growth phase whenever the heck it feels like it. So if it's Friday the 13th or Tuesday the 12th, and it's a full moon, your keloid may decide to go into a growth phase. Hypertrophic okay. scars, on the other hand, are pretty predictable. They usually may get a little bit thick, but they're not going to get much larger or much thicker after about a year. And so those are always a lot easier to treat because we know that there's a predictability to the way that they behave. Keloids, you know, all bets are off. And so I always tell patients that with a keloid, you got to get it treated as early as possible. And if it starts itching or if you're playing with the keloid on your ear, your body perceives that as a trauma and you are what I call a type A healer if you are a keloid former. That means your body doesn't know how to turn itself off after it's had an injury. It wants to keep fixing it. And when it fixes it, it makes all that extra collagen and the thickness of the keloid. And so the last thing you wanna do with the keloid is be overly involved with it. So stop scratching, rubbing, picking, doing all of those types of things because you're going to really encourage your body to think that it's got to do a little bit more fixing. Okay. So 
the other piece of our question was a hyperpigmentation. It's a domino effect, right? So you got to take care of the keloid first and then hopefully the hyperpigmentation. Okay. All right. So here's another question. The audience, they're, they're helping the show. Here we go. So uh, this is from Heather. She says, my cheekbones are darker than the rest of my face. Is that something that can even out? And yes, it's always possible. But again, we have to figure out why, right? So when um, particularly patients with skin of color have darker cheekbones, it's one of two things. And without seeing you, it's, one, it's still one of two things. So um, sometimes the skin is a little thicker, almost velvety. And that condition is called acanthosis nigricans. And so often we will see a little bit of this discoloration and, and thickening of the skin on the cheekbones, sometimes on the back of the neck, sometimes on the knuckles. And acanthosis nigricans is typically associated with people who have insulin resistance or may be diabetic. And so usually when somebody presents with that, I do ask them about their other medical history and make sure that they you know, are seeing a primary care doctor and if they've got diabetes, it's well controlled because that is not going to get any better until the insulin resistance is managed. Okay. And so a lot of things that we see in dermatology on your skin represents what is going on internally. And so, you know, you, dermatologists have always been sort of joked about as being kind of the magicians or, you know, the, the you know, we, we can always tell the secrets of what you've been doing based on what your skin looks like, because it, a lot of things that we see are representative. Um, the other option for discoloration on the cheeks is another condition called melasma. And melasma, um, I usually say, is a combination of hormones plus sun exposure. And so we tend to see it more commonly in women, but I have had some male patients who have it. Mm -hmm. But it's hormones plus sun exposure. And so almost uniformly, most of my patients who have melasma enjoy being in the sun. They like to go sunbathing. They got like to go to the beach. They're outdoors in the yard, playing golf, running, doing all that kind of stuff, and zero sun protection because mm -hmm. brown folks think they don't need it, and they do. <laughs> um, so, you know, we don't cure melasma. There's definitely some treatments, but part of the treatment really is making sure that you are vigilant about your sun protection. And if I have somebody who's got melasma and they are unwilling to wear sunscreen, our conversation is over quickly because that's a non-starter for me. You can't expect that it's going to get better if you're not managing your exposure to the sun. Well, you know what? You've got it in my head now. Now I have literally I have sunscreen in um, in my car door, my driver's side door. So I know I was like, I'm always gonna have it. So even if I forget to bring it out of the house, I've got one, a spare in the car, just in case. Cause I do go and, and I, I do play golf or we go to the beach or something. And I was like, I gotta have that sunscreen. Dr. Brooks been in my head about black folks with sunscreen. So that that is fantastic. So there's some great questions that are, that are coming in, but you brought up a good point during your answer. So I wanna address that. Um, other conditions that can impact the skin, right? And so you talked about diabetes. And I think sometimes people are thinking about their skin as separate from those other conditions like hypertension and diabetes and, and, and whatnot and those things. But your skin is your largest organ and it's going to reflect what's going on really what you're putting into your body and what's going on inside your body. So help people understand the relationship between uh, skin problems and other conditions, health conditions, and that could be impacting them. Yeah, I mean, just, just as you mentioned, skin is our largest organ. And so, you know, one of the conversations that I've had on repeat really for the last three years during the pandemic is talking to patients about the fact that skin, not only is it your largest organ, but it is an immune organ. And so if anything ever affects your immune system, it's no surprise that you're gonna have some skin problems, right? So if you are stressed, you know, exacerbated by you know, your immune system, mm -hmm. no surprise your acne might get worse, your eczema may get worse. 
with a lot of patients who've had COVID or even a COVID vaccine, all of those things tend to be an insult on our immune system. No surprise, we have some skin manifestations of that. Yeah. Um, so with diabetes, absolutely. High blood pressure, not per se, but for people who have poor circulation, we can end up getting varicose veins. We can end up getting some hyperpigmentation on the lower portion of the shin. Another condition called stasis dermatitis, which we tend to see with people who've got varicose veins or kind of puffy legs, usually associated with some um, hypertension or some cardiac abnormalities. Um, you know, psoriasis can affect the skin, the scalp. Um, you know, there are other thyroid disease absolutely can affect your skin and your hair. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, there are just about every internal organ shows itself on the outside. <laughs> All right, y'all. So even though you might be trying to hide it, what's going on inside, it's going to show up on the outside. And so we can't. So there's there's only so much you can do to get rid of those things on the outside if we're not taking care of the inside. Uh, there's a great uh, question from uh, Janine, and she's following up on the sunscreen. So I, I know we've talked about this before, but just kind of remind the people that are watching right now, what's the type of sunscreen that we should be looking for and we should be wearing, uh, and what are some of the best options for people of color in particular? Yeah. So um, there is a difference. You know, people say sunscreen, sunblock, they're sort of interchangeable terms but not really. Um, so sunscreen and, and sunscreen, the terminology really has sort of gone by the wayside. So, so basically we want, first of all, a number. What does that number mean? SPF means sun protection factor. And there are a variety of numbers, usually from 10, 15, all the way up to 100. Um, the American Academy of Derm Dermatology has really been trying to simplify this whole system because it is very, very confusing. And I think often it leads people, gives people a false sense of security. Mm -hmm. and so typically anything, like if you're just going to get in your car and go to work and, you know, come back home, you probably be fine for a daily use of an SPF 30. Now, there are different types of light. So there's UVA and there's UVB. Um, and the sunscreen SPF rating only refers to UVB. There is no rating system for UVA. Both mm -hmm. of those wavelengths can potentially cause skin cancer. And so again, false sense of security. There is nothing on the label unless it says protects against UVA that will lead you to, to believe that you're protected against UVA. So what you need to look for is a something that says either UVA, UVB protection, or broad spectrum, okay. uh, is UVA, UVB. And then you look for the number, SPF 30-ish, 40, 50, whatever. Um, what that means is technically, if you were gonna go outside in one minute and burn, like if you look like one of Paltrow, and you go out and you burst into flames after a minute, if you have an SPF 30, you technically can stay out 30 times as long and get the same amount of damage. You're still gonna get the damage, it's just gonna take longer. Okay. And so what we have been trying to do with the American Academy of Dermatology is literally just say SPF 50 or greater, because once you get to 50, 60, 70, 100, a lot of it, you're not going to get significantly more protection between a 50 and a 60 than you will between a 5 and a 30, right? So I would say at a minimum, go for a 30, 40 on your regular everyday activities, if you're going to be outside playing golf or running or something like that, probably go with a 50 plus, right? And so that's the terminology we're trying to get to 50 plus instead of 60, 70, 80. Right. And that's the thing. More importantly, um, you know, the best sunscreen is the one you'll wear, right? It doesn't make it matter yeah. who makes it, right? Find one that you like and wear it because <laughs> if, it's, if you're not putting it on, it's not doing any good. Right. And people are very picky about their sunscreen. Some people don't like the way it smells or it feels. It's sticky. It's right, you know. So find one that you are willing to use and use it. But you have to use it appropriately. And so if you were going to go outside in T-shirts and shorts on a summer day, you need to use about a shot glass full of sunscreen to all your sun-exposed body parts. Because that is what was tested in the lab to give the SPF rating of SPF 30. 
So if you get up in the morning and you're all proud of yourself that, yay, I put on sunscreen, I'm like, well, how much did you put on? No, like this much. You don't have SPF 30 protection. You have probably like SPF 2. Right. Okay. Put on enough. And then the second piece of it is you have to reapply because no matter who makes it or how much you pay for it, it's only good for about two to three hours. And so whatever you put on in the morning, if you then decide to go meet your friend at the outdoor cafe for lunch at one o'clock, you have nothing. It's gone. All right. Mm -hmm. And then you play golf at six o'clock. You still have nothing. So you have to reapply every two to three hours. And so, you know, for people who may go to the beach for the weekends, I'd say look at the bottle. If your bottle has eight to 12 ounces, that bottle should be empty by the time you come home on Monday. All right. So y'all having that sunscreen bottle that's been you've been riding since last summer. Mm -mm, mm -mm. No, no. Unless you've been inside more often. So I, I, I learned the reapply thing and 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 I'm proud of myself. I did reapply uh, when I was on vacation recently and a very, very hot and outside a lot by the pool and um, did some re reapplying. I said, Dr. Brooks said reapply. So I, you know, about two or three hours, I reapplied. Uh, probably should have gone a little bit higher. I think we just, I think we were using a 30, probably should have used the 80. Um, but yes, look, some is better than nothing. And uh, for, for men that are in the same condition, you have to use the top of your head because that particularly, that's a extremely sensitive area <laughs> and it will burn faster uh, than other body parts. So uh, Janine, thank you for that, for that question. Um, I don't know what this is, so I'm assuming that you do. Uh, uh, Shakira is asking, uh, what can help with sun eruptions? Um, so, there are a few eruptions that are associated with sun exposure. Um, one of them is called polymorphous light eruption, um, PMLE. And usually, you know, the complaint that patients will come in with is I, whenever I got in the sun, I get a rash. Or some people say I'm allergic to the sun. And um, the short answer is there's nothing that you did to make that happen. Mm -hmm. um, often, interestingly, these are people who also enjoy being in the sun. <laughs> like a lot of people who are runners or swimmers, like they end up with this rash. Um, but we treat it symptomatically, so it's not dangerous. Not it's not going to um, affect your overall health, but it can be, you know, problematic and irritating when you want to be outside and you get rashy. And so, typically, I will tell those patients to take a non-sedating antihistamine before you know you're going to be outside. Absolutely be vigilant about your sun protection. And the sun protection starts with your clothing, right? So there's a lot, even just putting on like a cotton t-shirt, that's about an SPF four or five. So, you know, if you're not one to wear sunscreen, I will try and convince you to become one. But if you <laughs> refuse, then let's start with the physical protectors, like the hat, the sunglasses, the longer sleeves, those, all of those things can be very, very helpful too. Okay. So um, Heather is asking, the front part of my scalp is flaky and dry and even oil dries it out. So what can we do to help Heather? Ooh, get into that hair. <laughs> um, it kind of depends on, on, what is happening, but often when there is flaking along the front frontal hairline of the scalp, sometimes in the eyebrows, sometimes on the sides of the nose, that is a condition called seborrheic dermatitis. And seborrheic dermatitis is absolutely made worse by any kind of stress. Mm. We do tend to see it um, more commonly in change of season and more commonly in colder weather. I live in North Carolina now, but I lived in Chicago for a long time and seborrheic dermatitis season basically coincided with pulling out that winter coat. And so um, it, the theory is that it is due to overgrowth of yeast. And so that's one of the reasons why the treatments often involves an, an anti-yeast shampoo. 
Mm. That said, I always tell my brown folks with curly hair, medicated shampoos can be very drying. So, you know, you're trying to use a medicated shampoo to take care of your dry, flaky scalp, but then you're causing it because the medicated shampoo is too dry. And so you have to manage that with, you know, doing a first shampoo with a medicated shampoo if you need it, and then following it up with whatever else you would normally use for your hair. Um, I would also suggest um, sometimes you actually do need a, a prescription to apply to the hairline as well. Absolutely. And I'm just going to say at, at this point, understand that this is just general information. So anything, it's just nice to plan if you're already seeing a dermatologist for treatment, go with your doctor's recommendation. You can have a conversation about what Dr. Brooke is saying today, but do not just automatically start changing or stop any treatments that have been diagnosed or treat are being treated. Uh, so this is informational. This is kind of generally informational, but so, but if you want something more specific, you're going to have to set an appointment with a dermatologist to get that specific. So I just want to make sure that we've got that. One thing you mentioned that I want to make sure as we're getting, you know, through this show and everybody, thank you all for the questions. Keep them coming. We love it. Um, but you mentioned the changing of seasons. And I know that is like, we're getting into spring now, uh, coming out of those winter months. And when the weather changes, it has a different effect on our skin. What should we be doing as the seasons change in order to maintain our skin regimen? Um, and I know that that's a kind of a broad question because that's, that's individually defined, but it, how should we be changing that regimen in order to match the change in the weather? Like summertime is hot, it's humid, that affects our skin differently than that cold lack of humidity in the wintertime. Yeah. So a lot of that depends on where you live, right? So, um, you know, I lived in Chicago for 10 years and the seasons are very, as the Tyrans say, dramatical. Um, so, um, and I live in North Carolina now and it is a version of hot and humid absolutely during the summer, same thing in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And not so dramatic in the winter. Right. So, you know, and somebody who lives in a place where the weather is pretty stable, maybe like Los Angeles, you don't really need, you, know, you don't have too many seasons. You have like one. Right. So those folks can probably get away with one set of products. I usually tell patients to match your products to your wardrobe, not color coordinate. What I mean by this <laughs> <laughs> is um, if it is, you have the heat on in the house, you have your sweaters, you have, you need more moisture. Right. So just like you put more layers on, you need to kind of do the same thing with your products. In the spring and the summer, when you go get your t-shirts and shorts, you turn the air on, you lighten things up. Right. So therefore, you, you know, if you try to use a heavy moisturizer, in the middle of summer when it's you know 80 percent humidity all day long you're gonna have a problem with acne and just feeling like your skin is like really really clogged up so right. you have to lighten things up and so for most people two sets of products the spring summer stuff the fall winter stuff sunscreen always let's get back to that because <laughs> some people will say you know i only wear sunscreen in the summer and my response to that is how did you get here today yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So it, it just feels like when you say sunscreen, it's like, well, it's summertime thing, right? It, it, because that's when it's hottest. And I guess you do equate sunscreen when it's hot, not sunscreen when the sun's out. And so if the sun's out, then you probably need to have on, you definitely need to have on sunscreen. Speaking of which, is it okay to get the combo face moisturizer with sunscreen in it, because I, I do have that, whereas it's low and it's got an SPF 45. And so that, that does help. Yeah, you know, and, and a lot of companies are making those. And, you know, I think it's great because that provides fewer barriers, right? So, and I've even told patients, you don't need to buy a sunscreen moisturizer for the morning and a separate moisturizer at night. You don't need to. 
right? If you only want to buy one product, go ahead and use a sunscreen at night. Unless you're a vampire, it doesn't matter. It's just <laughs> you got a moisturizer. That's fine. Rather than having multiple products, it is perfectly fine to use the same moisturizer at night if you need to. All right, so that, that gets us here as we're, as we're getting close to the end of this program. But one more good question. We're talking about we we're talking about hyperpigmentation. We're focusing primarily on skin tonight. On our next show, we're going to talk about hair. So we're going to do have a good balance. So we're focusing on skin. So I see some hair questions. I'm not just ignoring you all, but tonight is about skin. <laughs> and then we're going to get to we're going to get to hair on the next show. But when we're talking about cleansing the skin. Because this is one of the things that, that, that I ran into and I've gone into different places every once in a while, I'll stick my head in Sephora and try to get some understanding on this. All right. So people of color, should we be using a toner? Okay. So that's a no on the toner. So y'all, I understand that the whole one, two, three, four, whatever they have in terms of the, the package says you're supposed to wash your face and use this toner to use this moisturizer to do this and do that. Okay, Dr. Brooke is saying don't need a toner. What is the toner designed to do? I blame Clinique. <laughs> All right, Clinique was the one, the company that first came out with the three step program, right? <laughs> Cleanser, toner, moisturizer. I'm still mad at them though that their little yellow moisturizer doesn't have a sunscreen in it. I'm mad at them about that. But they were the ones that taught everyone that you had to have a three-step program. Now, as a board-certified dermatologist, I have spent, I've actually spent some of my mental energy trying to figure out, like, why would somebody use a toner? Like, what purpose does it serve? I can't come up with a good reason. Okay. And more often, more often than not, I just have patients who use it because their skin is oily. Mm -hmm. and they're trying to like, they're like, well, I, I keep using it and my skin is, you know, the cotton ball still has stuff on it. I'm like, you can use a whole bottle and the cotton ball will still have stuff on it because that is sebum. Your body produces sebum as a lubricant. And when you try and remove it forcefully, <laughs> your body doesn't know what just happened. So it ends up making more sebum. So you're actually making it worse. Right. So, and that's primarily why most people use toner other than the fact that they believe they have to use one because Clinique started this whole foolishness. And so, and, and I do like Clinique products, but it's kind of fascinating marketing, right? You right. tell them to do something and they do it. I'm like, okay, well, I've been telling people to use sunscreen and they still don't do it. So what am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> You're not bombarding them every day with, no. promises, with promises of being, looking, having your skin glowing as a result, right? So you, they have this powerful marketing machine behind that. All right, so y'all save the money on the toner. How often should somebody wash their face? Is it, should it be twice a day, once in the morning, once at night, or how often should somebody wash their face? That's kind of controversial actually. Um, you know, theoretically twice a day, just like you brush your teeth. Okay. So, you know, certainly depending also on what you do like, and, and what, like, if you are a full makeup wearer, you know, obviously you want to get all the makeup off. Most people just as part of their morning routine will get up, wash their face, brush their teeth, take a shower, get dressed. You know, certainly if you're going to be doing something like working out, I would encourage you to wash your face after you come back from the gym or from a run or something like that. Mm -hmm. Once or twice a day, I think is perfectly fine. Okay. All right. So, so y'all, y'all got that? You, you got it. All right. Go ahead. <laughs> Wash with this. Your hand. Okay. okay. None, of, none of the towels, none of the, the, the special devices they give to, no, wash, just wash with your hands. So okay. one of my most joyful days in my career was learning that Clarisonic went out of business. I never understood that product. I just don't understand why people will put a motorized toothbrush on their face. I don't get it. <laughs> no need. No need. Gentle cleanser. Use your hands. Why? Because what are we talking about today? Hyperpigmentation. Right. What does hyperpigmentation come from? Irritation. Right. And those all those things that you're using. Okay. All right. So Janine is saying to confirm, don't use facial toner. Right. 
Waste of toners, waste of, waste of money. I know she said she used Thayer's Witch Hazel, and she said it takes off the extra dirt. <laughs> you don't need facial toner, Janine. Just, just you your hand. Right? You just need a better cleanser if you if it's not getting yet. So focus on your cleanser, Janine, not not the toner. Because yeah, if you're not if you still have facial dirt, and remember some of that what you see on on the cotton ball is something that your body's already putting out, so it's going to keep showing up. Oh, good question. That was my next question, Charlene. You, you're right in my wheelhouse. Okay. Should we exfoliate? Should we be using that scrub, that the that rough scrub that, that's supposed to pull off all that dead skin? Should we be using that, particularly people of color? Yeah. I will tell you, personally, also not a fan, right? So I will use a scrub periodically, like personally, like on my elbows, knees, but I have never exfoliated my face. Um, and, and what I find too is patients misuse them, right? You're scrubbing mm -hmm. too much. Right. You're trying to scrub the acne away. You will never scrub acne away. That's not how it works. You need to get your acne treated, but you can't scrub it away. They're trying to scrub the hyperpigmentation, but you end up causing more hyperpigmentation. Right. You know, and so, you know, so if you wanted to use an exfoliant, I probably would not do it frequently. Like you certainly don't need to do it every day. Once a week may be fine. But, you know, the other issue is, um, you know, first of all, why? Why are you doing it? Are you doing it because you feel like you have a lot of excess dry dead skin well then let's talk about why you have that right do we need to talk about the other products that you're using that are drying your skin out do we need to talk about the fact that you you may have a thyroid problem or vitamin d deficiency let's fix that because exfoliant is never going to fix that you know and so or, or do you have seborrheic dermatitis you know you, all that flaking you can't scrub that away it's going to come right back and so trying to figure out why you are doing it and what you are trying to achieve by that all right, so now I do like when they put the scrub when I get my feet done. So I'm gonna keep getting that. Put scrub keep... is fine. Okay. 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 Nice feet. Not cute. <laughs> okay. Just what? Just. Wait, 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 you just know about grassy feet too. Any <laughs> <laughs> here? And then, and then, you know, and I went to a restaurant and they had. Um, a uh, salt scrub for your hands uh, to when you're washing your hands. And that felt good. My hand felt very, really, really soft after that. But it's not something that, that we should be doing, it's particularly on our face, um, on a regular basis. So, they're, they're thinking, so, right, so, so Tanya wants to, so this could be the last question because we're we going to go all night with this. So Tanya's asking, she said, please settle the argument. All right. So should we use a washcloth or not? I say yes as a black woman, change with every bath or shower. Should we be using a washcloth? When yes. we, when we yes. bathe? It kind of depends on what we're washing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so just a general outside of our skin. Yeah. Uh, we're taking yeah. a bath, taking a shower. Should right. we use a washcloth? Yeah, below the neck. Below the neck. Okay, got that. Um, now, if we're washing our unmentionable areas um should we use a washcloth or should that be changed out often okay all right <laughs> so tanya washcloth yes um changing with every bath or shower that that that's now let's talk about the examples for a minute <laughs> okay because i mean it's skin right so we right. we take care of that too right. um and so you also don't want to scrub too much down there either. Okay. Right. Um, you know, and that's a whole, that is a whole other conversation, a whole other show about. You get a whole other show about how we. What is happening down there. Um, right. <laughs> people will try and scrub things away that, will, again, will never be scrubbed away. Right. Um, but you do have to be careful. You know, skin functions as a, a barrier, right? It, its major function in our life is as a barrier. It is a barrier between us and the outside world. And it prevents viruses and bacteria and all of that from entering our system. And so when we irritate or break our barrier, 
we are putting ourselves at risk. So at some level, you know, we all often get in our own way. So, yeah. you know, nature, God, whomever you believe in, did a good job of making us. We right. just need to kind of let that happen instead of trying to get in our own way about exfoliating the skin because the skin is there for a reason. Yeah. So your, your, it sounds like your, your, your best skin products are the foods that you put in your body, right? And how, <laughs> and how you, so that, that's number one. Also, uh, a good SPF sunscreen will do, go a long way in tor- terms of uh, protecting your skin. Hyperpigmentation has to be diagnosed because everybody's body is different, but it's, it's some damage that has happened. And then how your body responds to that damage could cause some hyperpigmentation. But there's also hyperpigmentation that's related to diabetes, right? And so if, you're, if your diabetes is not well controlled, you can buy all the products in the world. Hyperpigmentation is probably going to come back. We touched on keloids a little bit tonight. Uh, we might need to revisit that in terms of how to get rid of keloids. And, and, but that body is, your body is over responding to some sort of damage, injury, trauma that has happened. And that keloid is, is a result of that. And so continuing to mess with it, touch it, trying to get rid of it is, is actually having the opposite effect. It's going to increase that opportunity. I did want to ask about, because I know beards are back in now, um, but there's a lot of products that I've seen across the sphere of social media trying to help men grow that thicker, fuller beard and how good those products are. Um, I don't know. I've tried one or two (laughs) and they have had little to no effect because I'm assuming it's because your beard is based on your how many follicles that you have on your face and, and no amount of product is going to create a follicle in an area that doesn't have any. Is that correct? <laughs> yeah, I mean, kind of for the same reason that people, you know, a lot of women want to grow hair down their back, right? So, and we can talk more about this when we do the hair show, but there are three cycles of hair growth that are really of predetermined length. We have a growth phase, a resting phase, and a transitional phase. And the growth phase is different for different areas of the body, and it's different for every person. So for example, the growth phase of your eyelashes may be two weeks. The growth phase on your scalp hair, or somebody who has like shoulder length hair, may be two years, right? And so that is one of the reasons why your eyelashes are never going to reach your chin. Right? The growth phase is predetermined. There's nothing you can do that's going to make it that much longer. You know, Latisse and all those types of things will make it a little thicker and a little bit longer, but you're never going to have to shave your eyelashes. Right. right? So, but for people who are focused on, I want to grow my hair all the way down my back, that may not be in your cards. Right? And we all know people who just, for whatever reason, can never grow hair past their shoulders. You know, things change, especially as we age and your health conditions may change, but the growth cycle of your hair, you can't change that. And so, you know, what you want is healthy hair, but that doesn't necessarily mean, and there are plenty of people who've got very, very long hair that whose hair is dry and brittle and looks terrible, right? right? So, you know, by working on what you have been given and making sure that it's the best that you can make it and versus what someone else is was going on over there. We right. Over there. Yeah. So you got to be happy with yourself, right? Be happy with what, what you were presented with, what you were given and make that as healthy as possible. And I think that's a great, a great way to end this first show inaugural show of Melon and Poppin real derms, real talk. Uh, we're going to see the next show is going to be about hair. So today we focus primarily on skin the next show is going to be about hair. We are just so excited. Thank you so much. We're going to go through and I'm going to pull some of these questions for the next program. So please, please, please join us next time. because We're going to answer some of these questions. Our next show, we're going to talk about hair. Uh, we just got a little tease about hair cycles and all that stuff, but there's a lot that goes on with hair. Uh, he said, please touch on natural products for cancer survivors growing back hair. Yes, Charlene, we will take care of that as well. Uh, Because we're going to talk about everything. And so that's why we had to have Dr. 
Dr. Brooke do a show. We couldn't just have her once or two or three times a year. We had to have a regular show because there's so many different things that our skin um, touches and that it impacts our skin. And so we couldn't just do it in once or twice. So we have to have a regular show. We're going to have some special guests. We're going to have some, some other dermatologists. We're going to have some great conversations here. So thank you all. Thank you, uh, Janine. I appreciate that. So we'll put that on screen. Thank you, Janine. Uh, so really, really thank you all for, for joining us. We're going to get to some more. We're going to talk about skin hair. This is ongoing. We got her. We got Dr. Brooke here. So we're excited to have that. We will see y'all next time here on blackdoctor.org. Keep putting your comments. Keep putting your questions in there. And like I promise you, we're going to go and we're going to pull them and make sure that we are going to talk about all the things that you want to talk about. Plus some things that you need to know that you didn't even know you needed to know. And that's why we have Dr. Brooke. <laughs> that's why we have Dr. Brooke here. We will see y'all next time on blackdoctor.org.